Our subject today is the seven trumpets. Most of you probably realize that in the book of Revelation there are three categories, there are three large groups of seven. There are, are the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. There's actually a fourth group, the seven thunders. However, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, uh, John was told not to write what the seven thunders said, so we have no record of uh, what the voices of the seven thunders said. So we deal principally with the three categories of seven, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials. Now, built around these three accounts are what we call parenthetical chapters. That's after you are, are told what the seven seals are, then maybe a chapter or two is taken to talk about the uh, a special aspect of a special subject. For example, in chapter number 12 of Revelation, there's a chapter given there to the war in heaven. Uh, in chapter number 13, there's a chapter devoted to the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the numbering system that we call the mark of the beast. And that's the way the book of Revelation is written. We won't have time to talk about all those things tonight. However, we are going to spend our time this evening on the seven trumpets. The prophecy is found in the book of Revelation, chapter number 8 and verse number 6. It simply says this, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now many people have thought that the trumpets will all sound during the great tribulation period or at least during the final seven year period called Daniel's 70 weeks. If you think that, and by the way, I thought that at one point in my life, if you think that, then this lesson may turn some of your thinking upside down tonight. All I ask you to do is open your mind, and if after I'm finished this evening uh, you don't agree with what I'm saying to you, then you can go ahead and believe what you feel like you should believe. However, before you decide, I would like to ask you to look at the third trumpet. The third trumpet is found in Revelation chapter number 8, verse 10 through 11. And this is the way it is described. It says there, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter." I have been teaching prophecy now for uh, over 30 years, and when you're in prophecy, you get a lot of wild theories. I get mail all the time telling me why Henry Kissinger is the Antichrist, and uh, if you let this letter equal this, and this letter equal this, and multiply it by nine, and then uh, add it all up, and then turn it upside down, uh, you get 666. Uh, and of course, you all know that Ronald Wilson Reagan was the Antichrist because Ronald has six letters and Wilson has six letters and Reagan has six letters. Uh, one problem with that, if that is true, the Antichrist now has Alzheimer's. <laughs> so there are a lot of wild theories out there about Bible prophecy. However, Bible prophecy is of God. And even though there have been mistaken interpretations, there are also true and correct interpretations that God intended for someone to understand. Well, concerning this third trumpet, uh, starting about 1986 or 87, I began to hear rumors that the Russian word for wormwood was Chernobyl. However, I sort of just sloughed it off. I was busy, I was doing a lot of things, and I thought that's another one of those uh, prophecy rumors. And I'm in prophecy, but at the same time, there's a lot of times uh, some wacko theories out there concerning Bible prophecy. As you know, you may have some wacko theories of your own. But anyway, uh, I heard this theory that the Russian word for, Chern for Wormwood was Chernobyl. I had basically disregarded it for a number of years. But in 1995, I was sitting in my office in Richmond, and at that time, I was writing the Understanding the End Time Prophecy course, which 
we have here with us tonight. And we were behind on our deadlines. I was working really hard. And that particular day, I was flying. I was sitting at my computer, and things were going together really well. And so I was excited. I was making tremendous progress. And while I was all alone in my office, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, you know that thing you heard about the Russian word for wormwood being Chernobyl? I want you to check that out. And I, I was all by myself, just me and God, so I, I just was talking to him. I said, God, you know I don't have time to do that right now. I am very busy. I've got to get this course done. I'm three months behind, and I don't have time to do that right now. I don't have time to go spend three or four weeks at the library trying to prove whether this is true or not true. Now, you've got to understand, it was just me and him there, so we were sort of just having this conversation. And to tell you the truth, I mean, I was working as hard as I could work, and to think that I could leave that and do something else, I just thought was a little unreasonable. So it was like the Lord spoke back to me and said, look, it won't take you any time. If you'll call the library, they'll do the research for you. Well, since it was who it was, I was a little afraid to disregard what I was hearing. And so in frustration, I yanked the uh, drawer open to my desk, pulled out my phone book, dialed the Morrison Reeves Library there in our town, asked for the reference department. I said to her when she answered the phone, I said, ma'am, this is Pastor Irvin Baxter. I told her that because if you tell me you're a pastor, a lot of times they'll do favors for you, you know? So I was uh, pulling all my cards out. Uh, I said, this is Pastor Irvin Baxter, and I heard a rumor that the Russian word for wormwood is Chernobyl. Now, I would like to know if there's any way you could research that for me and tell me whether it's true or not. Now, what she did absolutely stunned me because she said, yes, that is true. Because you see, the Russians used to take wormwood for medicinal purposes. And the wormwood would turn their tongues black. And the Russian word for black is chernin. So they begin to call Wormwood Chernobyl. And she rattled it off the most horrible string of information you ever heard in your life. Well, I was going through a quick conversion here on the phone. I said, well, ma'am, I don't doubt what you're telling me, but I'm going to write an article about this, and I would like to have documentation. Is there any way you could give me some documentation for what you're telling me? She said, yes, I'll call you back. About 20 minutes later, my phone rang, and she had the books, she had the page numbers, proving that Chernobyl was the Ukrainian word actually for wormwood. Well, I was ready to hang up the phone and I said, ma'am, I have to ask you one more question before we hang up. It's not normal, you would have known all this off the top of your head. How did you happen to know this? She said, well, I'm working on my doctorate in Russian right now. And I've been studying these things. Well, needless to say, when I hung up that phone, I was in awe. But it made me reappraise this whole prophecy because now it looked like to me I had proof that the Russian word for wormwood was Chernobyl. Consequently, I decided I'd better study a little bit more about it. I went to the bookstore, found a book called The Truth About Chernobyl. It was written by a scientist who was there at the time of the horrible nuclear explosion that occurred in 1986. Let me take a few minutes to tell you the story of what happened there because I have come to the conclusion that the third trumpet did sound in 1986. Let me give you some more information as to why I have come to that conclusion. Here's what happened. On April the 26th of 1986, about 1.26 in the morning, there was a Russian scientist who was in charge of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant located in the Ukraine, which at that time was in the Soviet Union. He decided to conduct some experiments. He foolishly disengaged some of the safety equipment on this nuclear power plant and gave the order to lower the rods uh, that into the core of the reactor that start the nuclear reaction, which of course was normally designed to produce electrical power. So when he lowered these rods, he didn't realize what was happening inside of the reactor until it was too late. 
he finally saw the heat gauges and saw that it was way too hot in there, so he, in panic, ordered them to raise the rods back up. However, when they did, or when they attempted to, the rods wouldn't come back up because the heat had warped them and they couldn't get them back up. They had a full nuclear meltdown on their hands. The first explosion hit within 35 seconds. It hit with such a force that it blew the two million pound lid off of the reactor. It went into the air and it came down cocked, leaving the atmosphere exposed to a full nuclear fire for the next three weeks. Ultimately, there was more nuclear radiation released at Chernobyl. There was 10 times as much as was released at the bombing of Hiroshima in World War II. Now that's not the end of the story. The second explosion hit just a few seconds after the first explosion. And of course, by now, the roof of the uh, reactor was totally gone. Some of the workers that were there, not knowing what had transpired, ran down, pulled open a door to see if they could see the problem, and found themselves staring full face into a nuclear fire. The heat was so intense, they slammed the door back, turned, trying to get relief from this horrible heat, so they fell on the floor where it was the coolest. In the meantime, because the roof was now gone, the heat started to dissipate enough so that this man and his partner could make their way one block down to the medical station. Before this worker could get down to the medical station, his skin was already hanging in ribbons from his arms. Both he and his co-worker died within a few weeks of that particular time. Now, in the meantime, the fire trucks came, and these firemen were fighting a nuclear fire, and many of them did not realize they were fighting a nuclear fire. They were, in fact, signing their own death warrant just by being there. They fought that fire for the next three weeks. Most of those firemen died not too long afterwards. When the fire finally was put out, they had to get rid of the fire trucks because they had absorbed so much radioactive material that anybody that got around them would be contaminated and their health would be destroyed. So they brought bulldozers in to bury these fire trucks. And just in the act of burying the fire trucks, the bulldozers absorbed so much radiation, they had to bring other bulldozers to bury the bulldozers. Now there was a city nearby where most of the workers of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant lived. It was a city called Pripyat. Housing is very inexpensive in Pripyat today. As a matter of fact, you can have the finest house in Pripyat free. No one lives there. No one can live there. The radiation was so powerful in that area that it actually created a no man's land about the size of the state of Massachusetts. Now, if that were all that happened, it would not have been so severe, but that's not the end of the story. When the explosion occurred, it blasted radioactive material one mile into the sky. The wind caught it and carried it into Sweden, into northern Italy, into Germany, into Great Britain, and finally, even in a diluted form, to the east coast of the United States of America. People living in the area, the immediate area of Chernobyl, the thyroid cancer rate went up 248 times. Now, to add to the problems created by Chernobyl, it began to rain incessantly at this particular time. I don't know whether they know if the rain was caused by the explosion and by the radioactive material or whether it was an act of God. We don't know that. Nevertheless, it rained incessantly for the next five days. Everywhere it rained, it brought the radioactivity out of the clouds and down into the soil, and it created huge areas that they call brownouts because no vegetation will live there now. Not only, though, did it cause these brownouts, even that would not have been nearly so deadly, but the most deadly thing about this was that it rained so hard that the water flowed into the rivers, and then those rivers, those deadly rivers, wound their way down through Europe. I'd like for you to remember the scripture in the prophecy. It said, many men died 
because of the waters. And as those waters flowed through Europe, anyone who drank of those waters absorbed the nuclide, Sesium 137, into their body. And Sesium 137 has a half-life of 30 years. It will go into your bone marrow, and it can lay there 30 years before it causes cancer. Now the results so far from Chernobyl are that 125,000 have died. Two million are infected, they estimate. Now that means walking around in Europe right now, there's two million people with this thing in their body. Doctors and scientists say that the worst is yet to come. That once the genetic damage that was created by all of this nuclear radiation begins to affect the next generation and the next generation, they don't even know how to predict the far-reaching implications of the Chernobyl nuclear accident. The last thing that happened to me when I was dealing with Chernobyl, by now after I read all these things, I came to the conclusion that the third trumpet did sound in 1986. Now this is real revolutionary because I had been taught all my life that the trumpets happened during the Great Tribulation. So I started looking in the Bible if there's any proof for this. And to my astonishment, there's no proof of that. Zero proof of that. Now earlier, I had learned that the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse, I learned the identity of those horses, and I don't have time to go into that tonight. However, that is lesson number four of our Understanding the End Time series. It's also chapter three of a message for the president. I had learned the identity of those horses, and I'll just give you one quick preview. The red horse is communism. And you'll have to understand the lesson. You have to go through the lesson before you're able to accept that, I'm sure. But if you go through those lessons, I think you will end up agreeing that that is true. Uh, all nations who are under the spirit of communism are called red nations, whether it's red China, red Russia, or what it is. And that's just a little bit, just a little piece that you can at least hold on to. Once I found out what they were, it dawned on to me, uh, dawned on me that communism has been in the world a long time. And capitalism has been in the world a long time. Once I learned that, it's revolutionizing my mind about how the book of Revelation was written. So it wasn't as difficult for me to start thinking that perhaps the trumpets could have sounded, or at least some of them could have sounded as well. Well, there were 100,000 reindeer being raised domestically for food in Europe. All those had to be slaughtered. There were tens of thousands of rabbits. All those had to be slaughtered. Finally, there was a video that I got called Chernobyl, and it told all about the water and how it affected the hay and all the food they had to throw away. I guess the last thing that happened to me, I was writing the article for our magazine, and... I went to the library to write because that way I get away from the telephone and away from my staff. Nobody knows where I am, and they've got a room they let me write in sometimes. So I went down to this room, and in front of the room is the video counter, and on impulse, I said to the video clerk, do you have anything on Chernobyl? He said, you know, I think we have one, one video. I asked him if I could see it. He got it for me. And when he handed me that video, I was not prepared for what I saw. It was not a religious video. It was put out by the humanities. But on the front cover, it said, Chernobyl, the taste of wormwood. And when I put that video in their machine and watched it all the way through there in the library, here was the number one thing they stressed. It was the waters that made Chernobyl so deadly. Now, before you reject this, think of this one thing. What are the odds that this is a coincidence? That right in the end time when all these prophecies are to be fulfilled, that an incident called Chernobyl would occur. Now, if you were reading a Ukrainian Bible, you would read, a star fell into the earth by the name of Chernobyl. That's what you would read in Ukrainian. Now, what are the odds that that's a coincidence? I, I don't think the odds are very high. I think you have to take a real sober look at this possibility. Now, I can see some of your minds racing right now. 
You're saying, wait a minute. If that's the third trumpet, what's the second trumpet? Logical question. I ask the same question. Let's take a look now at the second trumpet. It's found in the 8th and ninth verse of Revelation chapter number 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And I thought, well, that surely has not happened. A third part of the ships were destroyed? But then it dawned on me that in this century, we had a horrible, horrible war called World War II. Now, up to World War II, the greatest war ever was World War I. That was called the Great War because 8 million were killed there. World War II, 52 million. I said to my research assistant, Kathy, I said, Kathy, go to the library, find out how many ships participated in World War II, and find out how many were sunk. She went to the library, spent several days researching. When she came back with the information, this is what she brought to me. In World War II, there were 105,100 27 ships, counting merchant ships and battleships, that participated in World War II. There were 36,387 destroyed. How close is that to one-third? Interestingly close. Now, a war that kills, kills 52 million people. Should we be surprised if God thought that was significant enough to put in his prophecy? I don't think that's surprising at all. Now the other thing in the prophecy of the second trumpet was that there was a great mountain that, mountain that was burning with fire that was cast into the sea. Have you ever seen a picture of a mushroom cloud of an atomic explosion? Does it look like a great mountain? Is it on fire? And was the atomic bomb cast into the sea? Japan is out there, a little island in the sea. Is that right? Makes too much sense, doesn't it? Now, so you've got a mountain burning with fire, You've got one-third of the ships destroyed. Now that happened in 1939 through 1945. The third trumpet sounded in 1986 with the Chernobyl nuclear explosion. Next question. Well then, what's the first trumpet? In the first trumpet, it says this. Revelation chapter 8, verse number 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Do you remember studying in school about the scorched earth policy that many of the generals followed during the war? They made it a practice of just destroying everything as they were invading the country. I remember them trying to teach me that in history class when I was going through high school. Now this could well be referring to the huge guns, the uh, hail and fire mingled with blood. Remember, John is seeing a vision. He has never seen a nuclear cloud in his life. He has never seen a mushroom cloud. He doesn't know what, he's only recording for us what he has seen. And John went to his grave not knowing what he saw. So he merely is giving it to us, and he never did understand it. Because it wasn't written for him. It was written for the people of the time of the end. It was written for us. So now we're taking what he was told, and we're trying to fit it into what in fact has happened in this era that we call the end time. This appears to talk about the bombings and the huge guns and the horrible war called the Great War. Also, it was World War I, 
where biological weapons were first used. And this could well refer to that uh, as well. Now, I wouldn't be willing to tell you I'm absolutely 100% persuaded that I'm right on this. I think this is correct. Now, the second trumpet, I can't deny that one. The third trumpet, it's too much there for me to explain away. So if the third trumpet was Chernobyl, the second trumpet was World War II, it seems quite likely that the first trumpet was World War I. Now, whether that is true or not, we now need to take a look at the fourth trumpet. The fourth trumpet is located in the 12th verse of the 8th chapter of the book of Revelation. And it reads like this, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Another account of this prophecy is given by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. Only he says it a different way. He says in Matthew 24, verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now in Revelation chapter number 8, talking about the fourth trumpet, it says the sun will not shine for one-third part of the day, the moon shall not shine for one-third part of the night. Jesus merely said in Matthew 24, the days will be shortened. Now I'm very happy to have my wife with me this evening, and she came home one day. She said, uh, I was driving down the road today and God spoke to me. Well, we've been married 33 years, and she hasn't said that to me very many times, unless she wanted a new dress or something. <laughs> she said, uh, God spoke to me today. I said, he did. What did he say? She said, I was driving along thinking about that prophecy of Jesus where he said that the days would be shortened. And I said, God, how are you going to shorten the days? And he said back to me, I already have. And she said, you have, Lord? How have you done that? He said, I've speeded everything up, and people don't realize it. Anybody here tonight feel like time sort of flies? Now, in my logical mind, I begin to try to analyze, could this be true, and what's God doing talking to my wife? I'm supposed to be the prophecy teacher anyway. <laughs> So I thought about this for a few days, and then it dawned on me that this couldn't be true. Sure enough, God could not have spoken to her because if men run, ran the four-minute mile, if God speeded the clocks up, he didn't shrink a mile. So it should take them five minutes now to run a four-minute mile because everything speeded up by a third. All you men, that makes sense to you, doesn't it? Right? So I said to her, I don't see how this could be true. I mean, I knew the days were going to be short, and I knew it was about time for it to happen, but I couldn't explain this. And she looked at me like only a woman can do and say, I can't explain that, but I still not know God spoke to me. As if, case closed. Well, about a week later, we were in a restaurant, and there was a professor there from the local Indiana University College. And the subject came up. He has become interested in what we do. He reads our magazine all the time. He's read my books. And so we began to talk about prophecy, and this subject came up. And my wife, she had this burning inside of her anyway because she really felt like God spoke to her. And so she starts talking about this. And the professor looked at me and he said, that's no problem. Don't you understand Einstein's theory of relativity? I said, why, sure, I read that stuff every morning for breakfast. <laughs> he said, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity says that time and speed are related. That's what the, spirit, the theory of relativity is all about. Well, I didn't know what to think, but when we left, 
She looked at me, she said, I've been praying this week that God would show you this. And she said, God just now set him in that restaurant so he'd show you this. Well, I still wasn't totally convinced. A week later, my phone rang, a friend of mine from Minnesota, and the subject came up. And would you believe what he said to me? He said, that's no problem. Don't you understand Einstein's theory of relativity? Well, believe me, the next time I was at Barnes & Noble, I bought two books on Einstein's theory of relativity, and no, I have not read them yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> now, I have to confess to you that in spite of all my resistance, I suspected that perhaps it was true because, wow, is time flying. And I didn't understand it all, but I did know this. Whether it was true or not, when it did come to pass, it would, in fact, be the speeding up of the days. Now, we have to choose one of two things that we believe here. Either the number of days will be shortened or the length of the days will be shortened. Which one is true? We know the days are going to be shortened. Some people have thought that God will change the day of the rapture and speed it up here. But when I looked at Revelation 8 and the fourth trumpet, that's not what it says. It says the third part of the, the sun will not shine for a third part of the day. The moon will not shine for a third part of the night, which means to me the length of a day will be reduced by one third. So what she was saying God said to her, I knew that's the way it would happen. The only question was, had it happened yet? Well, another reason I felt that it could not be the number of days being shortened was because God's word cannot be broken. And in Daniel chapter number 12, verse 11 through 12, it says this, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and 35th day. Now, this is a specific prophecy of days. From the time of the Antichrist until the end of his reign is going to be 1,290 days. If God decides suddenly, well, we can't stand this many days, we've got to reduce the number of days, then he's going to have to change his word. Well, you know the Bible says the word of the Lord is forever settled in heaven. And so I concluded he couldn't change his word, and therefore it had to be dealing with the length of each day, not the number of days. I think you can see where I'm coming from there. Well, I left that behind, and I decided I'd go on and take a look at the fifth trumpet. Now, in Revelation chapter number 8 and verse number 13, it talks about the three woes. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And these are called, in prophecy, the three woes. The fifth trumpet is the first woe. The sixth trumpet is the second woe. The seventh trumpet is the third woe. Now, when the fifth trumpet sounded, we read this. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven, and he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke. I'll never forget the day I picked up, it was either Time Magazine or Newsweek Magazine, and I saw this picture. You may rem remember seeing this picture. This is a picture of the skies of Kuwait after Saddam Hussein set 700 oil wells in Kuwait on fire, mad because he was being driven out. So he decided to destroy everything he could. For over three months, $5 million worth of oil was burned up per day as a result of him setting these oil wells on fire. And furthermore, the sun was not seen in Kuwait for over three months. Now, the prophecy said that when this fifth angel sounded, it said that a smoke came up out of the pit and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke. The picture you're seeing right now is a picture that was taken at noon, but it looked like it was midnight. And when I saw that, I thought, Lord, could the Gulf War be the sounding of the fifth trumpet? Well, I continued to read in the prophecy, and verse 7 through 10 
tells us more about this prophecy. You're looking at helicopters here. And the reason they're there is because the prophecy says, in the shapes of the locusts, I saw locusts with breastplates of iron, faces of men, their stings were in their tails, and the shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared into battle, and the sound of their wings was as a sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Now, if you lived 2,000 years ago, you had never seen an airplane, you had never seen a helicopter, how would you describe a helicopter? I mean, you're having a vision, you're seeing these bills of smoke, and all of a sudden these helicopters come flying out of this smoke. What would you say? These locusts have breastplates of iron. They got the faces of men. The gunners back there in the tail, their sting is in their tail. And the sound of their wings is the sound of many chariots going to battle. I thought, well, that's about what I'd say. Make sense to you? Well, that's not all it says. It went on, on to say in this prophecy, And they had a king over them, which is, in the, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. I looked up both of these words. First of all, Apollyon in my Greek dictionary, and the definition given was a destroyer. Well, then I went to the German Tribune, I also looked up the word Abaddon, and the meaning of the word Abaddon is also the destroyer. And I found out that many of the translations of the Bible actually translated this passage, the destroyer. They didn't say Abaddon or Apollyon. I have a 26 translation Bible on my desk, and it just many of the translations said they had a king over them called the destroyer. Well, back in 1991, I was subscribed to the German Tribune at the time, and they had an article on the Gulf crisis. I'm reading the article, and it said, Saddam, quote, the destroyer, Hussein. And I thought, why did they say the destroyer? And I knew this scripture was in there, and I knew what that meant, but I thought, maybe it's a coincidence that they would call him the destroyer. And so I saved the article, but I didn't say anything about it to anybody because I, I wasn't sure. However... December the 13th of 1997, I received my Jerusalem Post through the mail. My wife was driving me somewhere to speak, and so I took it along to read it as I was going down the highway. There was a story in there, a human interest story. A Jewish family had just escaped from Baghdad in Iraq, one of the very last Jewish families to make it out. And so this lady was telling her story in the Jerusalem Post. It was not a religious article. It was not a prophetic article at all. But she was telling her story. And she was telling everybody that when Saddam Hussein was being carried by his mother during the pregnancy, she had horrible problems, so much so that the doctors recommended an abortion. Saddam's mother did not want to get an abortion, so she suffered through the pregnancy, but she moved into the Jewish sector of Baghdad, and the Jewish doctors helped her through the pregnancy. But when Saddam Hussein was born, she decided to name him Saddam because Saddam means the destroyer. Now that was in the Jerusalem Post. So now I found it in the German Tribune. Now I found it in the Jerusalem Post. And I said, God, how could this be? And then on the next question was, how could it not be? Here you've got sun being hid by the smoke. You've got the locusts, the attack helicopters coming out of the smoke. And you've got a king over them by the name of the destroyer. And Saddam's name literally means the destroyer. And I have pretty well come to conclude that the fifth trumpet sounded in 1991. Does anybody know how many trumpets there are? Does anybody know what happens at the last trump? 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trump, this mortal must put on immortality. This corruption must put, put on incorruption. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Don't look now. But if the fifth trumpet has sounded, 
we got one to go. And then the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You want me to give an altar call right now? <laughs> okay, well, but there's the sixth trumpet. If the fifth trumpet did sound, and I'll be frank with you, it looks like to me that it in fact did. Now there is a, there is a possibility that we are yet in the fifth trumpet era because there's evidence that these are eras. When the seventh trumpet sounds, it said, and in the days when the seventh trumpet began to sound, it's as though it covers a time period. We could yet be in the fifth trumpet time period because we really haven't heard the last of Saddam Hussein yet. He's still causing problems. So if there's anything left in that prophecy to be fulfilled, it may lie just ahead of us because there's still conflict there. But I think we should now look at the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is incredibly interesting. The prophecy of the sixth trumpet is located in Revelations chapter 9, verse 12 through 16. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice saying, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200 thousand, thousand, and I heard the number of them. Now this prophecy states that there's a war coming that will be triggered by an army of 200,000, thousand, a thousand, thousands, a million. There's an army of 200 million somewhere that will start a war, and the horrible results of this war will be the slain of the third part of men. Now if that literally means what it says, this prophecy says, this war will kill one-third of the world's population. We have almost six billion people on this earth right now, and that's a prophecy that just ahead of us is a war that will kill two billion people. I hope it does not touch any of us tonight, but I cannot promise you it won't. The only insurance we have is just be ready. If you're not ready, you need to find out how to get ready because there's not much time left. If the fifth trumpet has sounded, we got the sixth, which is going to be horrific, the worst war the world has ever seen. 52 million died in World War II. Now this prophecy says 2 billion? Focus for a moment on the fact that there will be 200 million soldiers. Mao Zedong, the late leader of China boasted in his diary that he could field an army of 200 million. He boasted the exact figure in the Bible. Now, is that a coincidence? Or had atheist, communistic leader Mao Zedong been studying the Bible? I don't think he'd probably been studying the Bible. But he inadvertently named the exact number of soldiers that's in that prophecy in Revelation chapter number 9. Now beyond that, there has never been a nation in the history of the world that had enough population to put 200 million soldiers on the battlefield. We only have 250 million total population in the United States of America right now. And so there had never been a nation in the history of the world that could put 200 million soldiers on the battlefield. However, now Mao Zedong says that he can because they have 1.2 billion population. So this appears to be a prophecy that China will start a war. And the prophecy says about China that this army was reserved for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. It's like the sleeping giant has sort of been in waiting. Everybody refers to China as the sleeping giant. Don't wake her up. Let me tell you what is happening in China right now. The Chinese economy suddenly began to escalate very rapidly during the latter part of the 70s. As a matter of fact, since 1979, the Chinese economy has increased 
by an average of 10% per year for the last 20 years. Now, nations today, if you can increase your economy by 2 to 3% per year, that's considered a good year economically. China has increased by 10% per year every year for the last 20 years. Now, this has produced terrific economic surpluses. When you're growing an economy the size of China is by 10% per year, you're producing a lot of economic surpluses. Right now, China sells to us at least $80 billion more per year than we sell to her. So China's pulling $80 billion a year out of the United States of America. That is staggering within itself. What is China doing with all this extra money? Well, she's buying military equipment. And her favorite source of military equipment, believe it or not, is Israel. And Israel needs the money, and so they're selling it to her, and guess where Israel gets her equipment from? Now, that isn't even to mention the high-tech computers that President Clinton has sold to China over the last two or three or four years. So China is in a huge military buildup. Now, we also know that about two years ago, China swallowed one of the most vibrant economies on the face of the earth. Not only is her economy growing by 10% per year, but one of the four Asian tigers economically, Hong Kong, just went under total Chinese ownership a year and a half ago because the lease that Britain had ran out, and so they handed China one of the most throbbing financial centers of the entire world. Not only did they absorb China, but they're now telling us that they will soon reabsorb Taiwan. Let me quickly tell you the Taiwan story. Taiwan used to be called Formosa. When the Communist Chinese conquered mainland China in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of Free China, and he ran to a little island 90 miles off the coast of mainland China called Formosa. Formosa today is called Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek hoped to reinvade the mainland from Taiwan. He's never been able to do that, but he has done something very remarkable. The nation of Taiwan has become the 12th largest economic power on the face of the earth. They only have 21 million population, but they are 12th economically in the world. Furthermore, they have the second largest gold reserves in the entire world. So China looks at this rich morsel called Taiwan and says, we want it back. We're going to take it back. There was a high Chinese official that made a statement. This was carried in the New York Times in 1996. And this is what he said. Mr. Freeman of the U.S. State Department quoted a Chinese official as asserting that China could act militarily against Taiwan without fear of intervention by the United States because American leaders care more about Los Angeles than they do Taiwan. Mr. Freeman characterized the statement as an indirect threat by China to use nuclear weapons against the United States. He went on to say, I have quoted senior Chinese who told me that China would sacrifice millions of men and entire cities to assure the unity of China and who opined that the United States would not make comparable sacrifices. China said, we will take Taiwan even if it means we have to bomb Los Angeles off the map. China does have intercontinental ballistic missiles that will reach the west coast of the United States of America carrying nuclear warheads. Now remember this prophecy is of a war that will kill one third of the world's population. Apparently it will have to be a nuclear exchange to kill that many people and the most powerful nuclear power on the face of the earth is the United States of America. The Taiwan issue is the hottest issue. In 1996 Taiwan had elections and they so disturbed China because she hates democracy so bad that China lobbed missiles off the coast of Taiwan. And President Clinton ordered aircraft carriers 
into the Straits of Formosa. We've sent 100,000 men there, and the 100,000 men are still there right now. At the same time, the House of Representatives passed a non-binding resolution that if China invades Taiwan, that the United States should defend Taiwan. In today's Indianapolis Star, Madeleine Albright is in China right now, and the Chinese officials warned her very soberly, whatever you do, don't mess with our right to Taiwan. We will not tolerate any interference whatsoever. It appears that we could see a conflict break out over the Taiwan issue at any moment. If I had to guess, I would say that will happen within the next year or two, is the way it looks to me. Now, I'm not positive it will be over Taiwan, and I'm not positive the United States will be involved. I certainly hope we're not. There has been an interesting development this last year. Both India and Pakistan became nuclear powers, and they're next door neighbors to China. India has one billion population. Pakistan has over 200 million. Between those four powers, they have 2.4 billion. They have well over one third of the world's population right there in Asia. So there could be a conflict among those three powers Certainly, we don't know for sure, but it certainly looks like we're right on the brink of the sounding of the sixth trumpet. What better way to bring the Antichrist to power than for the world to wake up to two billion dead? You've never heard such cry for peace and total disarmament and total nuclear disarmament as will happen when we awake to two billion dead. Now, that's where it looks like to me we are this evening. At the same time, there just may be an angel in heaven polishing on that last trumpet. And when that last trumpet sounds, the Bible says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the seventh trump. When you look at the prophecy of the seventh trump in Revelation chapter 11, it says the seventh trumpet sounded and a voice said, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever. Quite a book, this Bible. And what a wonderful day to live. If you're right with God, it's the greatest day in the history of the world. If you're not right with God, you ought to be scared out of your mind right now. Because you and I are the generation upon whom the ends of the world have come. What do you say? We have one last great revival to welcome Jesus Christ back so that we can crown him as King of kings and Lord of lords. If you're for that, would you just raise your hand and worship him right now? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name.